Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 184 of the Mo Money Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Morehouse. Welcome back to the show, and this is a repeat guest. I'm so excited to have back so soon. Um, so about a year ago, almost to the day, um, I interviewed Shannon Lee Simmons, who wrote the fabulous book, one of my top recommendations for books, guys. So if you are looking for a good um, inspirational, motivational book that you can literally just just it's a page turner. It's that good. It's just like a page turner. It's called Worry Free Money. That is her first book that came out in 2017. Um, well, she like within the year uh <laughs> launched her second book called Living Debt Free. Obviously, with that one, you'll know from the title, it focuses specifically on debt. And as she kind of explains in the episode, she did uh, want to kind of go more in depth about debt in her first book, but basically she could have just, it turned into a whole separate book because there's so much to talk about. Um, and also, again, kind of like um, Melissa Leong's book, Happy Go Money, which is focused on, you know, financial literacy with a, a very positive, happy spin. That's exactly what Shannon Lee Simmons is all about too. She's very positive and motivational, no judgment, no negativity. And in her second book, Living Debt Free, it's all about um, just not feeling guilty or bad or or judgmental on yourself if you're living with debt and then taking action steps to get out of debt. I think especially, and I know this actually to be true because I, I work with clients one-on-one -on -one who are dealing with debt. There's so much uh, personal shame and just embarrassment and guilt when you, you have debt. You just feel like, oh, I can't believe I'm in this situation. Got myself here. What am I doing with my life? And then there's so much external judgment too, right? With like, I find like in the personal finance world, Sometimes there's like two camps of people, like the people that are all about like, you know, I'm in debt, I'm trying to get out of debt, those kind of, um, you know, debt crushers. And then there's the other side of the camp who who are like these super frugal people and are a bit judgmental, I feel like, on the debt crowd, which is ridiculous because I feel like we're all in this life together. We all make choices and sometimes we make mistakes. It is what it is. Get over it. Um, let's help each other out. Let's like let's lift each other up so we can help each other, um, you know, live debt free. So we're going to talk a lot about just some really good advice that she has in her book. If you're dealing with debt. This is, you're going to love this episode. You're going to love Shannon. I mean, I love her. I think she's just the best person in the world. So you're going to love it, but you're going to want to stick around to the end because I'm going to have some information about a contest because I'm going to give away her book too. Um, yay for book giveaways. So, uh, before I get to that interview with Shannon, here's just a few words about this episode's sponsor. This episode of the Mo Money Podcast is supported by the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, CDIC. Have you ever been told to be careful where you put your money? Because if your bank goes under, you'll lose everything. Here's the thing. That person has no idea what they're talking about. Thanks to the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, our savings are protected. You see, CDIC insures deposits at its member financial institutions around the country in the event of a failure. They currently protect over $792 billion in deposits. And in their 52-year track record, they've handled over 40 failures. Guess how many people lost their protected deposits during those failures? Zero. Not a single dollar of deposits under CDIC protection was lost. You may be wondering, awesome, how do I make sure my savings are protected? That's easy. Since coverage is free and automatic if you bank with a member of CDIC, just check your bank's website to see if they have that purple CDIC logo in their footer. Or visit cdic.ca to find their full members list. To learn more about how CDIC protects you and your savings, visit cdic.ca. Once again, that's cdic.ca. Well, welcome, Shannon. Back to the podcast. It was like one year to the day almost that you were on my show for the very first time. I'm excited to have you back. And I'm kind of super, I mean, I'm pleasantly surprised that you already have a new book oh my in gosh, the same I, year, like two I books know. basically in one year. I know I didn't plan it that way in the beginning. It just, that's the way that it ended up happening. And it was very quick. I love both of these books and I always wanted to write this other debt book Yeah, in my yeah. head though. It was like a year or two away. But yeah. then life, life just worked out funny. So here it is, well, two in a row. <laughs> yeah. How, so how did it happen so quickly? It just, 
So you know. I had originally had an entire part of worry free money. That was yeah. a shame free way to pay down debt. And it was a mm-hmm. massive part. And my editor was like, mm, this is a whole book in itself. Like, no, yeah, it's like, this isn't just a chapter. <laughs> yeah. And this is a big concept or you're tackling yeah. here. And, um, so I had said like, okay, well, when the time is right, like I want to write this book. Um, yeah. so, you know, putting it out yeah. there and they were all like, yeah, absolutely. And then, they called me in March, um, while I was still on the worry-free money, you know, book tour, so to speak. Yeah. And they're like, so how about writing that book, uh, Ooh. so that it comes out January, 2019, or, you know, just at the yeah. very tail end of 2018. And I was like, really? And they're like, that's fast. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we, that's what we want. And I was like, well, I will not say no to an opportunity. And yeah, so that's how that happened. But I think that it was, I already knew so much what I wanted to say with this book yeah. and I had so many ideas for it that had been percolating, um, well, well before mm-hmm. that it, I mean, it was intense. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it was yeah. a really hard, really hard time. <laughs> um, but I would say that this book fell out of me more so like worry free money. I remember percolating on ideas for like three years before I even put pen to paper to like, yeah. be like I think I want to write about this. This book fell out of me comparatively. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like a lot of that is because you already had that first book out? So you're like, I did it. I can do it. I can do it yes. again. Yes. Yeah. The, the amount of self-questioning was way less. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also, I have a great working relationship with my editor and we weren't getting to know each other in this book. We already yeah. were a well-oiled machine. So I knew I could already hear her voice in my head as I was writing. I'm like, Oh, that's not a thing that that's something that she's going to pick up on or Ooh, I'll work around that. So it was also a lot smoother in the editing process as well, mm-hmm. because I, I had already like leveled up that skill and we had a great working relationship and we weren't just kind of like getting to know each other, which, you know, for worry-free money, yeah. it was my first everything. So I was very yeah. nervous and timid and stuff. Absolutely. And it honestly, this book, when, uh, I saw it, like, I think I saw it on Instagram it, it coming out. I'm like, Oh, that's exciting. It does feel like a very natural next step after worry-free money. Cause worry-free money is like kind of all things finance and, um, I like that you came out with books specifically to debt. Cause as I talk to, you know, a lot of people in my audience or work with clients one-on-one debt is like kind of the main thing. Most of the time they're like, no, like I know I need to deal with my financial life, but debt is like the most pressing matter. And that's yeah. all they can think of. So that, that makes sense that you need to have like a full book, just dedicate to that one topic. Yeah. And I think that it is just dedicated to that one topic. And I think it's the way that it's kind of approached that we're really excited me about trying to tackle that Mm -hmm. because so many people have debt and it doesn't have, doesn't mean everybody has, you know, 80,000. It could be, it could be 8,000 or 2000, but it's a topic of conversation that a a lot of people are having and they're so um, frustrated in it. And some people are really like ashamed of it or, um, and it creates this emotional, you know, issue like, it's, it's an emotional thing to talk about debt. And so if we can just clear that out of the way, it's all aspects of the word um, that we can move on to very exciting financial things as well. Absolutely. And I, I know recently there was an article, maybe CTV or something, um, where you were quoted kind of talking about why we need to kind of shift our mindset and, and kind of talk about debt in a different way, which I really appreciated. And there was a part of the article, which I really loved, where you said, you know, most people don't get into debt because they're buying these luxury items that and most people like assume, oh, if you have debt, it's because you did something stupid. It's on yeah. you. You shouldn't have gone to Nordstrom or whatever. And it's like, well, no, if you actually know, like you do working with clients, most of the people don't get, you know, it's because they like splurged on one thing. You're like, oh, now I owe like a thousand dollars from this purse purchase. It's like, no, it's just life that happens and being unprepared. Do you want to kind of yeah. talk a little bit about, cause I know the great thing about your books is you, you talk about like real people and their situations. So people reading can be like, oh, I can identify with that. Or I know someone like that. So what are yeah. some like the typical ways people get into debt? like the real ways people get into debt. The real ways. Yeah. Um, I completely agree. I I've never heard anyone say, Oh man, I can't wait to be in debt. Like, so if somebody's yeah. in debt, it's because something has happened. Right. Mm-hmm. And so most of the time it happens like the, the threshold to go from a person who doesn't have debt to a person that does have debt is often because of something that was not in your control. So mm-hmm. your cat got sick or you had to go back to school, or there was a a leaky faucet that needed a plumber and it was a thousand dollars that you didn't have like stashed. Right. So usually to go from no debt to debt is something that was 
definitely a trigger or a tripwire as I call them, but one that isn't, that was sort of out of your control. Like you had to spend to get your way out of it or else there would yeah. be some sort of big consequence. And so, or, and sometimes that can even be something like my sister's getting married, destination wedding, and I'm the maid of honor. So I'm going yeah. but again, that to somebody is just as, that doesn't mean that that person was living the high life. Like they mm-hmm. didn't want to miss their sister's wedding. Like it's totally mm-hmm. different. Yeah. Um, and then, so I guess that's what, it's not mindless at all. That's when mm-hmm. it happens in the first place. It's, it's the opposite of mindless. In fact, I would say it's so thought about, it's overthought about, and then the person beats themselves up. And then what mm-hmm. happens though, is that if you've kicked off a debt loop, now you have this hangover, so to speak of whatever mm-hmm. it was that happened to you. And now you have less money every month to kind of survive, financially survive your day-to-day life. And then, so not only do you have to pay the minimum, you also have to pay the extra on top to pay it off. And then inevitably life will throw some curveballs at you. There'll be something else. And then Mm -hmm. it can go deeper and deeper. And so I've often noticed at the beginning, it's things like someone getting sick, taking Mm -hmm. care of someone vulnerable, going back to school or like professional development, um, family obligations or social obligations that feel like a need. It's not Mm -hmm. a want to you know, for example, be in the wedding, right? So those are the reasons that people are, I'm saying this in quotations, overspending or, or whatever. And then where the mindless spending that everybody loves to pounce on Mm -hmm. when they're talking about people with debt, typically that'll kick in after a a sustained and prolonged period Mm -hmm. of time that you've been carrying debt. And that's that like, you know, effort moment where if you've already got $4,000 $4,000 on a line of credit. What's another 400. That's when that creeps in because you feel like you, there's no point in tackling this. I'm never going to be able to pay it off anyways. Mm-hmm. Now it's interesting how you frame that. Cause yeah, I think a lot of people expect that people get into debt because of that mindless spending, but really that mindless spending is almost like a symptom or, or just something that you kind of do after you already get into debt. Cause like you said, no one wants to get into debt. No one plans to get into debt, even no, if they, they don't, you know, it's a, yeah. And I think I, I'm really glad that you kind of talk about that because a lot of the people I talk to, like you kind of hit the nail on the head. That's exactly why whenever I'm like, how did you get into debt? It's not because, oh, I went on a shopping spree or I just eat out too much. You don't get into debt because of that. It's because of something big. And then they're just kind of like pile on. They're like, whatever, like everyone's in debt. It's, it's normal. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and they also can't see a way out. So they're like, well, I guess this is it. I'm just going to keep on tacking on debt. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's that, it's that acceptance of the, the idea that there's no point in trying. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. so that's when, that's when mindless spending can keep you in debt. It doesn't get you into debt. It can mm-hmm. keep you in debt. Yeah. And I've even heard people say too, that they can't imagine. And I've, I've like, it's shocking how many people in debt say this, but I, you know, I can't imagine my life outside of debt because I've been in debt for so long as if it's like, Oh, it's such a luxury for people to be debt free. I'm not one of those lucky people. I wasn't born rich or I wasn't, you know, born with privilege. So this is my life. And I hear that too, actually. And in the book, I actually say that specifically in one of the anecdotes, because one of the Mm -hmm. clients I was talking to was debt free for the, I was, I was asking him to like, imagine what being debt free was like. And he's like, I don't even know who I am without debt wow. because it started from the moment he went into university mm-hmm. and it just never, I mean, he was like late twenties at that point mm-hmm. and it just, it was always there in some form or another. Right. So there mm-hmm. was always a hangover from school. There was always a hangover here. Then there's always a little bit of a stubborn credit card that just never goes away. It's like, it's always just a part of my life. So yeah. that is a cool thing to start visualizing. Like, what is my life like without this thing that I've been saddled with for so Mm -hmm. long, you know, and getting excited about that Mm -hmm. and not in a way that feels shameful. Like think about what you could be doing if you didn't have this, like not exactly. Yeah. It's like, that's not, that doesn't, that crap doesn't work. I feel like it's been around for so long and that's being someone who's only dealt with debt a little bit um, when I was in my, I finished university and I still had a student loan. And so like that was required so I can finish my schooling and get my degree without that loan. I wouldn't have been able to afford, uh, to finish my degree. I had so much guilt because of that, because of all the, you know, articles and books that were out there about debt and just like the language that they used. And it could be part of it just that I'm a millennial. And there's a recent, um, survey that came out of uh, maybe a month ago talking about how millennials, uh, 
think about money or feel about money. And part of it was they don't like being shamed. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. yes. So many of us, especially younger people, are over this narrative that's like we're terrible. Oh, I think also millennials just get a lot of flack for being awful, entitled, lazy, la, la, la. And so tacking on. And also you're in debt because you're the worst. It's like, well, no, I needed it for school or I needed it to buy a car to get a job and all this stuff. It's just it's a narrative that I'm so glad that you're trying to sh- uh, to change because as I know, talking to people, it's like, it doesn't work. Like the shame game does not work. It's not effective. It doesn't motivate people. It just makes people feel like crap. And we're guilty about yeah. enough stuff in our lives. Let's not add, you know, some guilt for, you know, debt too. Yeah. I feel like it is demotivating. So one of the things that I've seen on the front lines is that, so that kind of like shaming and, um, you know, how much interest are you paying and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I call them scare tactics, right? Mm. So they work to a degree. So you hear someone say, think about how much interest you're wasting. You're going to spend this much in interest. That actually can motivate someone to jump into action or to start looking on the internet Mm -hmm. to Google, how do I pay down debt fast? Mm -hmm. Like fear works really well in a moment Mm -hmm. to kind of push someone to take notice. And so I think that the scare tactics are good for that spark of, yeah. Oh God, I've got to do something about this. Yeah. But it doesn't last. It, Mm-mm. that fear doesn't pack enough of an emotional motivating punch for the long run. So it mm-hmm. often leads to really super aggressive, unrealistic debt repayment plans, which mm-hmm. sets someone up for failure. Yes. Oh, I have to be mm-hmm. debt free in six months. This person on the internet did it. So yeah. oh. there's that. <laughs> And so like, and so when you fail, if you make a debt repayment plan and you fail at it, you feel like garbage because you're like, I'm already feeling blue about my finances. And now I still can't even do it when I'm trying really hard to. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece, the aggressive plans that are so unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And then I also think that it's hard. I think that we don't talk about that enough. Yeah. It's really hard to pay down debt. It's hard. Yeah. it, It doesn't. So like, I always say to people that paying down debt is a form of savings. Mm -hmm. It's a whole mindset perspective shift. Often people will come into my office and they'll say, I'm tired of paying down the past. I want to start building a future. And they don't see paying down debt as building a future. They Mm -hmm. see it as mistakes that they made Mm -hmm. and they're just dealing with the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. But if we take all of that emotional stuff off the table for a second, we just look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Your net worth is Mm -hmm. everything that you have minus everything that you owe. So anything that is increasing your assets or decreasing your liabilities or what you owe, so to speak, is improving your net worth. But seeing your savings account go from zero to a thousand dollars feels a hell of a lot nicer than seeing your student line of credit go from 19,000 to 18,000. Yeah. It is the net same thing for me as your financial planner. I don't yeah. care. That's yeah. an amazing thing to build your future either way. Yep. And so it's harder to pay down debt and to stay motivated. And the big thing for me with this book and with my clients is like fear works only so far. And then you're going to have to keep choosing the annoying thing to do again mm-hmm. and again and again. What happens in month eight? what happens in month nine, because sometimes people are going to pay down debt for like two years, maybe three or four. So can you be motivated long enough? And so what are the other ways that we can motivate you to, to keep choosing to stick to it? Even if you've been thrown a curveball, fallen off your plan and you got to get back on the horse and ride it. So I just think that fear has a fear and shame Mm -hmm. with debt. I think people still love to go there because I think Mm -hmm. that it is that initial rush of adrenaline to get moving. Totally. But I disagree that over the long run, it's motivating. In fact, I think it's the thing that makes people stop opening their bank up. Oh, hundred percent. That's why they put their, you know, head in the sand, so to speak, and just don't want to deal with it. And I think those yeah. are the people that probably come to you being like, I need help. I've, you know, ignored it long enough. I can't ignore it anymore. Yeah. And it's the, um, the lack of like wanting to face it because the fear and the shame is so real that even yeah. kind of looking at it or, or mapping it out is really, really scary because you're so afraid of what it's going to say, right? Like how yeah. long is this going to last? And it's sometimes it's easier and it feels more comforting not to know. So you kind of mentioned, um, people need to kind of move away from having fear as their motivator. What are some more kind of positive ways, some kind of ways that will actually sustain them through like a couple of years of debt repayment? 
Yeah. So I think that permission to live your life, I think that that is a motivator. So often, again, with these overly aggressive, um, unrealistic, as far as I'm concerned, debt repayment plans, one of the things that is unmotivating about it is how much of your life you have to sacrifice in order to stick to whatever this ridiculous plan is. So a lot of people don't even start them because in their mind, they assume that that's it. They're never going to be able to like grab a coffee. They're not going to be able to buy a pair of pants. Like, mm-hmm. th- like there's a, such an extreme version of what they expect that they're going to have to do to pay back debt that it's easier not to even begin. So I think that the real motivating is like permission to, to live your life even while you're paying down debt. So I'd rather someone put an extra hundred dollars on their credit card every month on top of the minimum payment that, and actually do it for the period of time it takes to pay it down instead of for four months, put 500 a month and then just give up altogether and then just rack it back up again. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that whole cycle that is Mm -hmm. so self-defeating. And so that realistic plan is super motivating. And I think the second thing is being emotionally motivated by it, Mm -hmm. by a positive emotion, not necessarily just by fear. So we had all, we already kind of touched on this actually, but you know, what I often ask people, you know, what is this debt holding you back from besides the interest that you're paying? Like, what is it about this that's making you so upset and what could your life be without it and asking it from a place of possibility rather than a place of, of, of shame and blame. So, cause I, I say this in the book, a lot of times when people come in my office and I ask them about their debt, they start, they put their hands on their chest and they like, they don't even know they're doing it. And there's mm. this oppressive body language that comes with it that I, mm. I see so often. And then I'll point it out to them. I'm like, look what you're doing with your hands right now. And they're like, oh, I didn't even notice. Mm-hmm. But when they talk about it, they pull their hair, they, they push down on their shoulders. It's like so uncomfortable. And this could be people who are highly professional, great mm-hmm. paying jobs. And, and they feel like they shouldn't have debt. Like they're like, I make a good living. I've got lots of thing, good things in my life. And I still have debt. And like, think about people who don't have all this stuff. And what am I doing so wrong? And why am I screwing up so much? Like what's wrong with me? So there's this, what's wrong with me kind of mentality. Um, the example, one of the examples I use about finding motivation is like, okay, so what is this? What, is, what, who could you be without this debt? Right. And so people often will just like light up when they start talking about it. Well, I could be, you know, um, it stresses me out so much that I feel like sometimes I'm a bad parent. It leads to lots of fighting with my partner and like my kid sees that and like, okay, so like that's an intrinsic motivator, not wanting to fight in front of your kids mm-hmm. that has absolutely nothing to do with interest. That yes. is super important, right? Like that's something that makes you sit up and say, I don't want to be this way anymore, right? Yeah. That is not about math or numbers, right? So mm-hmm. it's part of my job is to find that intrinsic motivator for that person. And then we make some sort of like reminder mm-hmm. so that in those moments when they're about to swipe their card, they can be like, oh, Remember this is important to me. Yeah, yeah. Remember, I actually don't want to do this for reasons that are so far beyond my personal finances, right? Like yep. it's, it's for my life. It's not for my money. It's for my life. Exactly. Exactly. No, I think you put it really, really well. I have a, a interesting question. So recently, um, I have a Facebook group and someone posed uh, this question to the group. There were some interesting answers. So I had to hop in there to be like, I don't know if these are some great answers. Um, but someone <laughs> was asking, Hey, I have credit card debt, but I also have an emergency fund. Should I use my emergency fund to pay off this credit card debt? What would mm. you say to someone who kind of poses that question to you? Oh, that is such a great question. And there's a lot of ways to approach this. So the first blanket thing I'll say is that everybody's situation is different, Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if you want what I would do, my sweeping generalization, I absolutely believe that emergency funds should be intact Mm -hmm. even while paying down debt Mm -hmm. or being built simultaneously, even Mm -hmm. a small amount, like $50 into a slush fund absolutely, um, Mm -hmm. while you're paying down debt because emergency funds keep you out of debt. That's Mm -hmm. their sole purpose in life. They are not improving your net worth. They are not your long-term savings. It is literally there so that when life throws you a curveball, you don't need to use debt to bail yourself out. So while you're on a debt repayment plan, if if all of a sudden your brakes need fixing and it's $1,000 and you've got a couple thousand dollars sitting in a slush fund and you don't have to break 
your, yeah. the motivation that's happening with your debt repayment plan to bail yourself out, the sense of control and mm-hmm. confidence that that gives you in your finances and how you run your money is like, there is no price tag. There is no yeah. amount of interest that, that I would pay that, that would take away from that confidence and that boost like, oh my God, the plan is working. Like it's working. I didn't have to take yeah. on more debt. So mm-hmm. I totally believe it. The only thing I would say, because I'm also a fan of lump sum payments Mm -hmm. onto debt as Mm -hmm. the best way to kind of slam your debt out of the water is how big is that emergency fund? Right. So, and what do we actually need it for? So if we've got one with like $10,000 sitting in a checking account, I'm probably going to take a bunch of it out and put it onto debt and just leave the bare bones minimum of that emergency account or that buffer Mm -hmm. that is there so that you don't take yourself to zero. And if there are some curveballs over the next couple of years, like you can handle it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was. <laughs> I basically yeah. said, I'm like, it's from like, yeah. When, Cause we've talked about uh, this a lot when you just look at the numbers. Yeah. Logistically, it makes sense. You're paying higher interest than you're earning. Um, you know, just having cash sitting in a checking or savings account. So why not just use that and pay off your credit card? Yeah. Logistically, that makes sense. However, the reason people get into debt usually is because they don't have an emergency fund. And so it's just, you can't just be like, Oh yeah, use that cash that you have to pay off your debt. And it's like, yeah, but, and I think also a lot of people, they just don't, especially people who have really never experienced a big life emergency. Uh, they're just like, Oh, I'll probably never use it. This just seems stupid to have cash hanging out there. Or people, a lot of people too think that, well, I've got a line of credit and credit card for that when they have an emergency. I'm like, that is the worst thing you can do. But it's, I feel like that's also an idea, maybe not so much the credit card, but definitely a line of credit. I know lots of people have that idea that it's for a safety net. I'm like, it's debt though. It's still debt. Yeah. (laughs) And I think I completely agree. I hear that too a lot that the line of credit is um, definitely the emergency account. I'm like, first of all, if you've got a line of credit, you should be consolidating your credit card debt, like stat. Totally. Let's lower the interest rate immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. looking at that, so now it's not open and free anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Or or maybe a portion of it is not. And second of all, there's so debt, debt and saving and the behaviors that go with that is so complex. And so you need emotional wins or else it's, or else you're not going to keep going. Right. And so liquidating everything and paying it down. It's about so much more than just what you're saying, comparing that interest rate uh, to what mm-hmm. you're getting in the, in a savings account or something. So I definitely am a, I'm a big fan of taking those emergency accounts and using them or, mm-hmm. and using them to keep us out of debt mm-hmm. and avoiding lines of credit as being our emergency account, because there's something awful. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Think about what an emergency is. Mm. An emergency is a scenario that is unexpected and stressful by its very nature, right? That's why we're Mm -hmm. calling it an emergency. It's never something good. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about a fun emergency here. We're usually talking about something that like, oh crap moments, right? So there's something really unsettling to somebody who's carrying debt or anybody really for that matter to bail yourself out of an emergency with debt because now you also have a financial hangover for that, including, and on top of your other debt, Mm -hmm. so now you have double whammy to pay back and it's going to sit there like a lump. And every time you log into your banking, reminding you about whatever it was that happened to you. And I think that's why sometimes certain debts can also carry a lot of emotional baggage, right? So like if it was a horrible breakup and you had to like move all of a sudden, it was totally unexpected. And now you have a couple grand sitting in a line of credit. Every time you log in, you're going to look at that and be like, that's my ex's fault. You know? And like that can't set you up for a win. Yeah. 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 100%. I think maybe people also get confused because you kind of talked about this, uh, what an emergency is. Some people are like, Mm -hmm. Oh, that means when, you know, my car breaks down, it's like, or it could be if a family member dies and you need to buy a flight across the country. Like, I think a lot of people don't quite know how to define an emergency, but like you said, it's like, it's like an unexpected expense that you need that cash to pay for now. Like, and you don't want to, you know, get into debt for it. So it can take a lot of, I kind of think of them as like two, there's like emergency emergency, which is like job loss. Someone's sick, like that kind of thing. And then I call it like, I call it slash. Mm. which is like where you kind of stash money to be spent on the spikes in your life, like your Mm. car or your leaky faucet or like what, or the friend's weddings or whatever it is like those spikes that are inevitably going to come. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do you kind of recommend then like having two different emergency funds? Like I, one, I yeah. personally do. Yeah. I have mm-hmm. one that is literally called emergency and it's been topped up and not touched for a few years. And then I have one that's called slush and man, that thing gets used because we'll build it up and then yeah. use it and then build it up and then use it and then build it up. And I never know what it's going to go towards because life, like life is random. And mm-hmm. there's often things that I, you know, I didn't expect back to drop my phone in the lake last year, but that happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. So like there, you know what I mean? So there's, there's things that there's no rules on that slush fund. It's like, whatever it is that my daily life can't pay for. Um, I'm happy to use that money in that account. And then I have my other one, which is like mad money, which is like, do not touch until doomsday. Right. So how much do you recommend to put, like, if you're to kind of give percentages or amounts, how much would you put in an emergency fund, the one that you do not touch and the slush fund? Yeah. So for me, I calculate out if me or my partner, if one of us, it's unlikely that both of us would lose our jobs. Well, I run my own business, but you know what I mean? Like, let's say fell on hard times, right? Um, At the same time. So I worked out like how much would we need to float, to crack the nut and eat, so to speak, if one of us lost our job for an extended period of time, like maybe three to four months before mm-hmm. somebody else got employment or, or whatever was it, someone was able to go back to work or whatever. Um, so I have that amount of money in there and which for our family is about five grand. And then we also have a little bit of extra emergency fund because we also have a kid and car and mm-hmm. like there's stuff. So we have $8,000 in our emergency fund account, but that's for me. Somebody mm-hmm. else might need three grand. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it totally depends. And somebody else might need 10 to 15. Like it, yeah. it depends on your life. But I think yeah. that somewhere between zero to like, I think mine's a bit high, but like zero to five, I even think is like good mad money. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then in my slush fund, we put us a, a, like a few hundred bucks in there every month and it gets spent, but mm-hmm. it builds quickly. And then it's like, we blow it to zero and then it builds quickly and then we blow it to zero. Mm -hmm. And because I'm assuming you have like those automatic contributions going in there, you hardly even notice money is going into that account. Right. So not to like name drop my other book, but like I (laughs) I super use the um, hard limit spending strategic banking plan. Um, Actually it's in both books because I'm so obsessed with it. (laughs) So um, Matt, my husband and I, we both kind of live out of this joint checking account where we Mm -hmm. put all the money we're allowed to blow to zero every payday. And that's where we live. And so we just, we only use that slush account when things that are out of the realm of our daily life that we can't really pay off uh, with the money that's in our spending account. And then we'll pull the money over and just pop it in there. Yeah. I like that. Um, I also know, I think you talk about it in this book about just creating different banking systems. And again, that's also could be a reason why people get into debt. They just don't have a very good system of moving their money around. Do you want to talk a little bit about what are some good systems? Because that's, again, that's the thing that I, I've done for myself. I've tried a lot of different things and figured it's something else that worked for me. And then I help clients do that too. And it's, I feel like it's not really talked about in most books, but I'm like, it's kind of the key thing to get your money organized for yourself. Yeah. I think the rest is details after that, because yeah. if you've got a good cash flow structure, then the money is going away. And then just take somebody like you or I to direct it in all the various yeah. places. But you can know everything that there is to know about ETFs and brokerage accounts and mm-hmm. insurance premiums and all this stuff. But if you don't have enough money to pay for those things, then it's all moot anyways, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the cash flow game that I love is, and I talk about this in both books and mm-hmm. I'm so passionate about it. If I ever write a third, I'll probably talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, probably not because I've beaten a dead horse. But there, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Um, but like, The big thing for me is that separation between the money you can and cannot spend every pay period. If you're self-employed, you kind of create that for yourself by, you know, stashing up your self-employment money and then kind of drawing it out on a monthly basis if you're able to do that. And if you're an employee, it's quite simple because you have a regular pay schedule. But figuring out what are your fixed costs, all the things that you have to pay, whether you like it or not, what are those short-term savings for our emergency or a slush fund? What are those meaningful savings? And those are the things that if we're talking in the context of debt, that's this thing I call your magic amount, which is the Mm -hmm. amount of money that goes on top of your minimum payment that actually pays down the principal. That's why Mm -hmm. I call it the magic amount because it's where all the magic happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's the key between keep staying in debt and moving forward and paying it down. And so that's why I say it is a form of savings. It is a form of meaningful savings because it's improving your net worth. Mm -hmm. And then everything left over is your spending money. 
And I actually like to take that money and separate it and put it in its own checking account. Mm-hmm. When, uh, and that's because I always have a very clear indicator of what I can and can't afford. Mm -hmm. So if it's like three days before payday and there's like $70 in there, then I have to eat what's in the fridge. You know what I mean? Like that's like, and and so we are still in a situation where I still rely on that as my indicator of Mm decision-making because when we have money coming in and out everywhere from every which way, sometimes we're using debit, sometimes we're using this credit card, sometimes we're using that credit card. We never really know what we can and cannot afford. Yeah. It's very unclear. And if you buy $40 for, you know, takeout pizza, you're like, should I have beat myself up about that? Or can I afford it? Yeah. Because is it fine? Mm-hmm. It, it might be fine, but I have no, I, I have no idea. And so having a cash flow strategy, every cash flow strategy should indicate to you you cannot afford this and you can. So at least if you're going to spend that 40 bucks, you know, am I making a decision that is outside of my means or is it Mm -hmm. totally fine? So do you kind of have the idea that it is preferable to use kind of your checking account or your debit account to do your kind of, you know, variable spending and keep, because I found just like, no matter what, even, and usually the excuse I get from people why they use their credit card so often is like the points. Oh, please. Um, totally. I, I right? also use, yeah, I yeah. use a credit card for most things too. Mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. I do, and this is like a weird thing that I tell everyone to do. And mm-hmm. I think it works. I've been doing it for years. Um, so I have the app on my phone where I have my credit card and yep. my um, bank. And so I also like points and I also love the convenience of a credit yeah. card, right? So if I spend something on a credit card that night while I'm brushing my teeth, and I say that because I've linked it with a routine in my life, I shut the door. I don't have a toddler running around. Mm-hmm. Everyone is gone. It's just me brushing my teeth. I pull up my app and it says pending transactions for the day, a hundred and, do- and like $2. And I physically move $102 from my spending account onto the credit card Mm. so that I've used the card. I've paid back the exact amount. And that checking account is still a representation of what I have to go to zero until the next payday. Okay. So that sounds like a hard habit to start for most people that are just like, you know, cause it's, so it basically like you have to check your credit card every single day. You have to, or else, or, and if you're not, if you don't want to be that, if you want to use it yeah, and if you're like, that's not a thing I want to do, then use debit and don't worry about it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Debit is wonderful in the sense that it's electronics. You can track it wicked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't have to carry wads of cash around with you and you're spending your own money. You're not borrowing. So there's no fear ever of getting a credit card bill that you're like, Oh, Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I feel like, yeah, just like thinking about like, yeah, that is literally the only way <laughs> you can, it's, you know, spend it's your the cre- only way. Yeah. It's the only way you can use your credit card and not be surprised. <laughs> I suppose the other way would be, I've never done this, but I suppose the other way would be, okay. So let's say that you had a monthly spend yeah. in your spending account of two grand or something like that, that mm-hmm. you could blow to zero on whatever it is that you wanted. I'm just using mm-hmm. big numbers here for, let's say it was a couple I suppose you could make the credit card limit match whatever that was Mm -hmm. so that you could use the credit card all month and then it would stop you when you reach the limit, which you know is also the limit in your checking account. Maybe that's the other way to do it. That's an interesting way too. What do you think? And uh, I'm not sure what you think about this, but um, some people uh, come to me and be like, what do you think about basically prepaying your credit card? Or like, you know, instead of having that debit, just putting that $2,000 already on the credit card so you can just use it and it goes to zero. Yeah. Is that I like, think that that is also a way that you could do it, right? Mm. So you put it down there and you just kind of rack it back up. But I think that the problem that you're running into there is that, so let's let's take that example. Mm-hmm. Let's, so let's say that on January 1st, I took that $2,000 and put it all on my credit card. I still have the problem of needing to, to track where I'm at because I don't want to spend more than $2,000 on my mm-hmm. credit card. So really, I feel like it's the same problem it is, yeah. that I would have the other way around, right? I still need to stay within this $2,000 limit and I don't really have an idea of where I'm at through the month. Mm-hmm. Okay. Last kind of question. Uh, I know this is part of your book. You kind of talk about, um, you know, some things that people may have to do if they're in deep debt, which is, you know, uh, unfortunately fairly common consumer proposals, bankruptcy. Um, you know, at what point 
does someone know whether they can do it themselves or work with like a financial professional to help them or kind of go like the consumer proposal bankruptcy route? When do you know when you're at that tipping point? Um, I think that, you know, because you've tried the other two first. Mm. So I think you've tried and failed on your own. I think you've maybe sat down with a professional and tried to map out a sustainable plan and it's not working as well. And I think that you have an income. So you have the ability to actually do something like for a consumer proposal, for example, or, um, credit counseling, you have an income that you're actually able to do it, but the burden of the debt is so great that you continue to sink in. And I think one of the big flags for maybe even bypassing, like do do not pass go and like maybe go right to a big source. If you're paying for your fixed expenses with debt, I think that's a major indicator Mm -hmm. that you're into a little bit of hot water because we can't get out of our rent. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't choose mindfully about our cell phone bill, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like once you've signed a contract, like you're in. And so if you're borrowing to pay rent or to pay your mortgage or to pay stuff, I, and it's not a short term thing. Like I have this thing I call a controlled burn where sometimes in your life, it makes sense to borrow just to survive. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking like, there's no end in sight. Like this is, this is the way that Mm -hmm. it is. And you're sinking further, even though you're actively trying to stop. I think that might be an indicator that like you might want to talk to somebody because the amount of debt is, is the problem. And the one thing about a consumer proposal is typically if you're dealing with a licensed insolvency trustee, um, they might be able to negotiate with your creditors and actually get the amount that you owe down. Mm-hmm. So, so they'll put you on a payment plan after that. Um, but again, it is an extreme scenario because it does affect your credit and it's and all of that kind of thing. But I also think it's a wonderful gift Mm -hmm. to a lot of people who might be thinking and can't stop. There's no shame in it. It exists for a reason in Canada. It's a tool in our toolkit. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me once again. I hope you're here one year later with your third book because <laughs> I love all I your know, books. No, I'm definitely taking. <laughs> I'm definitely taking some time off my brain. Fair enough. But I um, I'm super proud of both, and I'm so in love with this last book. So thank you so much for having me on to talk about you're it. You're so welcome. Where can people find more information about you and your new book, Living Debt Free? Uh, the best place is newschoolfinance.com. That's kind of the hub, you know, all roads lead to Rome. So if you click on the books link, you'll go to the books. Um, and there's also audiobooks there, which is pretty exciting. Very cool. And if you want to have an appointment, you can go there. And then we also have online courses. So it's kind of like the big hub for all things. Absolutely. I love your online courses. They're the best. So oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining me. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to tell everybody to read this book. And that was episode 184 with the fabulous Shannon Lee Simmons. Make sure to check her website out, shannonleesimmons.com, or her uh, New School of Finance website, newschoolfinance.com. Uh, there's more information about her uh, financial planning practice and her online courses on that website, and also more information about her book. Um, so make sure to check uh, all of that out. Also check out the show notes for in, for more stuff on what we discussed in this episode at jessicamorehouse.com slash 184. Um, I just have a few words about this episode sponsor, and then I'm going to share some very important details about how you can win a copy of Shannon's book. This episode of the Mo Money podcast is supported by the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, CDIC. Did you know that if you bank with a member of CDIC, your eligible deposits with that bank will be protected up to $100,000 in each of CDIC's seven different categories? So if you had $100,000 of eligible deposits in an account in one name and $100,000 of eligible deposits in a joint account, your entire $200,000 would be protected at the same financial institution. That being said, CDIC does not insure stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or other investments. Just cash and term deposits like GICs with original terms to maturity of five years or less. There is quite a bit to know about how CDIC protects you, so why not test your knowledge with their free trivia challenge at depositinsuranceendurance.com. Or to learn the ins and outs of how CDIC works so you can feel confident about the safety of your savings, visit cdic.ca. Once again, that's cdic.ca. So if you want to win a free copy of Shanley Simmons' new book, 
living debt free. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? It's amazing. Uh, you can either go to the show notes, jessicamorehouse.com slash 184, or you can go to the contest page, jessicamorehouse.com slash living debt free. And there will be all the info you need in order to enter the contest and uh, be in the running to win a copy of her book. Woohoo! Um, yeah, so that'll be amazing. Um, I'm also still running my contest to uh, give away the a, a, a copy of Melissa Leong's new book called uh, happy go money and more information will be in the show notes as well. Uh, jessicamorehouse.com slash happy go money is also the contest page. So enter both. Why not? Um, and you, uh, can get a good book, but even if you don't win, go out and buy these books. Let's support these amazing women authors because, uh, not only do they write amazing books, but we need to support our authors. We do. Um, and another way you can do that also too, if you don't have the funds at the moment to buy any books is go to the library, request that book and they'll get it in there. And that, that would be good. Um, a couple other things I want to share with you. First off, if you live in Toronto, uh, I'm going to be doing a free workshop at the Riverdale branch of the Toronto public library. It's all about how to start a side hustle. So if you want to be there to see me, uh, give this workshop and also be able to ask me your questions live. Uh, you can find more information on the Toronto Public Library's uh, website, but it's all going down on March 6th, 2019, this year. Um, so I hope to see you there if you live in the Toronto area. Um, next, in case you don't know, and you know, maybe you just learned about my podcast and so you're just learning all these things, um, I've got a free Facebook group called the Money Life Balance Facebook group. All this information can be found on my website. There's a whole um, community section uh, that talks about my Facebook group, my book club, which I haven't done one for a little bit. So I'm going to have to do another one soon. Um, you know, I run my own events called the Millennial Money Meetup, hoping to do some more very soon. And also I list all of the workshops and webinars that are booked for this year. So you can, you know, grab tickets or find out more information so you can be there. That is it for me for this week. I look forward to seeing you back here next Wednesday when I have a fresh new episode for you. Have a good rest of your week. I'll see you back here next Wednesday. <laughs>